Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 139 of the podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. Okay, we start off this week with a call from Jeff. If you'd like to call, you can call us on uh, Google Voice on the Wet Shaving Hotline. Call me anytime, 864-372-6234. Also got a message from Brian, and both of those were about the rant that I did last week. So uh, it was about the flag. So uh, if uh, if you want to hear that, go back to episode 138 and take a listen. <laughs> Anyhow, then we jump into the Thursday's Shave of the Day. Uh, I I got an email, and it was from an artisan who was, well, quite honestly, an artisan who was stepping up. Holy cow. Um, I'll read you that and read you what I wrote him back and uh, what I thought think of it all. Um, we're blessed, people. We are really blessed. All right, Friday shave of the day, playing in the woodpile this weekend. Uh, yeah, I went ahead and did it some more, but... Uh, it didn't work out too badly, and lo and behold, I can actually sharpen something. <laughs> All right, Saturday shave of the day, followed by Monday shave of the day. I'll give you a brief description, talk at least, about what I think the problems of short-term gains are. We've we've done some things, well, at least in my company, and, uh, you know, I understand why, but there's a price to be paid. And uh, sometimes people don't think of what that price actually is. All right, I saw a couple of things on Facebook that I had to put in. I've got links to them in the sh- in the show notes in the uh, in the blog. So if you go to the blog site, you can link to them. First off, who wouldn't love to see an old Daffy Duck Looney Tunes cartoon? Well, this is Daffy Duck looking for the shaving cream Adam. Holy cow! <laughs> I mean, how good is that, right? <laughs> And then finally, hats off to the bubbleheads. Um, there was a YouTube video that got put up, Life on a U.S. Nuclear Submarine. And um, if none of you folks have ever thought about it or ever experienced it or been in the Navy or had someone in the Navy, take a look at this and take a look at what our sailors actually go through and think about it for a minute because, quite honestly, okay, when I was in, we used to have a joke, okay, Unfortunately, it's not a joke. It's uh, it's a true statement. When I was in, uh, the the work clothes that we wore were the same clothes that were worn by federal prisoners. Yeah, um, we also had longer work hours in the Navy than federal prisoners. Um, we also did not have the rights under the U.S. Constitution because we were working under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is a tad more severe. So we're wearing the same clothes, we're working longer hours, and we don't have the same rights. And, oh yeah, by the way, we had the added risk of drowning. Yeah, so any time that somebody uh, tells me something that uh, has somebody doing, you know, either prisoners or people who uh, are rather nefarious, uh, you know, having circumstances that are better than our soldiers and sailors, yeah, it kind of gets to me just a little bit. But anyhow, like I said, hats off to the bubbleheads. Take a look at this video because uh, it'll put some things kind of in context, especially when you start thinking about the time that they're having to deal with this. Yeah, and they're keeping everything running at the same time. Good job, guys. Anyhow, let's get on with this show. Well, good Saturday morning, Rick. I wanted to tell you that I really enjoyed your rant regarding flags on Memorial Day. It needed to be said. And what gets me and really tweaks me is the unintentional good intentions of people that put their flag up, usually with their state flag, and that's wonderful. But what happens is, invariably, they put the U.S. flag on the right side of the state flag as you're facing it from the road. Now, they think that the U.S. flag should be on the right, 
everything needs to be on the right. But they don't realize that it's from the flag's point of view and not the observer's. When you go to a meeting or an auditorium where a flag is displayed properly, the flag should be on the right side of the speaker from the speaker's point of view, but on the left side of the speaker from the audience's point of view. And these folks really don't know the difference. And it drives me nuts. So what I've done is I've made up a nice, short, uh, worded piece of paper. Actually, there's four or five copies on a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. First off, thanking them for displaying the flag and having the effort to do so, and quietly reminding them that according to U.S. flag code, that the U.S. flag should always be on its own right or on the left as you look at it. Now, I travel quite a bit working on radio systems, and I see a lot of this. And I have one apartment complex in the town I live at <laughs> that I've sent several little notices, and I actually left them a voicemail, and guess what? doesn't seem to matter. But then again, I've had several businesses and individuals who, when I go by the next time after leaving the note uh, next to the flag, or underneath their mailbox, not in it, that's against the rules, but underneath it, I've come back in the future, and guess what? The flags are properly displayed. Makes you feel good. So, again, thanks for the Memorial Day reminder, and a reminder to your listeners that if folks really want to find out about the history and the background of our flag, then the simple thing to do is go on eBay, Look for an inexpensive Boy Scout handbook anywhere up to the 1960s, early 70s. And there are sections in there on the history of each flag that we have flown as a nation. Really good information. As you put it, really good stuff. So thanks again for the rant, and I hope you have a blessed week. This is Jeff in Palestine, Texas. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for the phone call. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, granted, it's going to Google Voice, so it's not like a real phone call. We can't interact, which is a shame. But uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the call. Uh, if you'd like to make a call, give me a call on the uh, the Brush and Soap and Blade uh, hotline at 864-372-6234. Yeah, what well, we always tell our scouts, because, you know, scouts uh, need to learn this stuff, what we always tell the scouts is that when you are facing a flag in, in an assembly or at church or whatever, the flag should be on the same side as your heart. So when you put your hand over your heart, the flag should be on the side of your body looking at it on your left side there, same as your heart. And uh, that seems to, uh, they, they quickly pick up on that and they understand that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is interesting. I appreciate people putting up the flag. I truly do. Um, and I encourage any and all that do so to uh, take the next step and uh, actually take a look at the flag code or uh, or read an old scout book like Jeff said because uh, <laughs> that's where I got a lot of my information back when. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. I also got a message from Brian on uh, Facebook. Loved your rant regarding the flag. Growing up, my parents, especially my mom, were very vocal about respecting the flag. While at a parade, my mom made a stand and salute any time the flag passed by. I make my son do the same. But didn't know until I went and read the code that my mom was actually correct. I just did it out of respect for her. I have two brothers who served in the Army, one who is still an active-duty pilot and soon to be going to Korea. When people disrespect the flag, to me... They are disrespecting all who have served, and in particular, those who have paid the ultimate price. My brothers both have buddies who didn't make it home. It makes my blood boil when I see the flag disrespected. Yep. Uh, can't agree with you more. Um, it does. It, uh, it just 
it touches a certain part that sometimes is better left untouched. Let's just put it that way. It uh, it does bug you a lot. <sighs> but at the same time, it's also curious. Um, one of the things that I tell my scouts, uh, especially the young scouts, because uh, the boys around here, anyhow, uh, the ones that come in, uh, the first thing that they do is, uh, you know, when they're doing a flag ceremony or something like that, they'll uh, they'll say, don't let the flag touch the ground or we'll have to burn it. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not right. You didn't do it with any intention to do harm. You didn't do it because you were being mean or bad or anything else. And if you read the flag code, all you got to do, and I tell them that, if you read the flag code, <laughs> I have a copy in the scout room, um, but uh, all you have to do is uh, make sure that the flag isn't soiled and uh, go on with business and try to do your best. But you're absolutely right. You know, there are some people that, that don't, they don't look at it. Uh, as a symbol of the country the way that you and I do, probably. And I understand that. I understand that people have grievances and people have issues. But what they, what they fail to understand is that there are some people that that flag means more than just the symbolism of a country. It's a symbol of sacrifice, of family, of sacrifice, of friends, of loss and of a desire to earn that loss and and to be I don't know uh, not only aware of it but also to be uh, to be good enough to have earned that loss and that's something that there are some people that I don't think they'll ever fully understand. And uh, and that's a shame. I actually feel sorry for them because to understand that feeling, to to have that emotional attachment, not necessarily to the flag, but to the memories and the thoughts that it represents, is something that is indicative of a level of love for your fellow human being that is deep and sincere and worthy, and good. And those that will never know that, I, I feel great sorrow for. There's nothing that I can do uh, that I know of to help that, uh, except to keep talking and uh, to keep telling them to at least attempt to understand what that piece of cloth means to some of us. Thanks for the message. All righty. Well, we're back in the uh, in the saddle again, and so it's Thursday morning. Beautiful, beautiful springtime morning. Although some people after Memorial Day would call it summer. I'm not sure. Is it summer or spring? I don't know. Anyhow, the key point is is that it's a beautiful, beautiful day, and uh, sunshine. You know, a few clouds in the sky, but they're very high elevation, kind of wispy. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Blue sky and, uh, yeah, just about the right temperature. Anyhow, <clears throat> anyhow, started out the day with an absolutely wonderful, wonderful shave. Okay, so did a couple of things here. First off, one of the other soaps that I got, uh, one of the new soaps that I got, was a new Katie's Bubbles soap, Honey Noir. Okay, first impressions. Um, it's got uh, it's got honey in it. It's got Tonka. I do not know what Tonka is. I'll have to find out. It's also got cedar and patchouli. Um, to me, okay, and I don't know what makes it noir. I don't know if the if the uh, if the the Tonka makes it noir or what, but. Uh, I'll have to do a little research and find out. That's always a curiosity when I don't know what it is. Anyhow, 
first impressions were, you know, open the jar up, good waft of honey just smacked me in the face, and uh, then got the uh, the notes of patchouli in the background, and just, oh, yeah, good stuff, nice. So went ahead and soaked up a, a Samog uh, bore brush, and... Uh, Proceeded to jump in the shower, jumped out, lathered it up. Beautiful, beautiful lather, just like all other Katie's bubble stuff that I have. And uh, really, really enjoyed that. No problems, no issues. You know, fairly light loading of the brush gives you uh, enough lather, enough good lather for a uh, three-pass shave, a little touch-up, and a picture. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, one of those things. Anyhow, the uh, so went ahead and lathered up with the Honey Noir. Um, again, three passes. Good residual glide. It's uh, you know once you even after you rinse your face off with water, if there's a little touch up that you need to do, you can do that with Katie Bubbles because there is some uh, some residual glide there that uh, makes that doable. All right. So the uh, so the razor that I used this go round was a Gillette Red Tip. So uh, the Gillette uh, 1950s uh, era flare tips. They had the uh, the regular flare tip. The blue tip was a tad milder, and then you had the red tip, which was well just a touch more aggressive. And uh, so we went ahead with the uh, with the red tip this morning. And proceeded to uh, pull out the uh, the treat sample pack that I have, and uh, that was uh, sent to me by Triablade. Thank you very much over there. And uh, back when I ordered some blades, and pulled out a treat silver, and uh, went ahead and threw the treat silver in the uh, Gillette red tip, and went to town. First strokes on that thing were just magnificent, really just magnificent. Although it, by the second pass, you could feel that the smoothness of the blade had diminished just a touch. Um, and I don't know if it was because I was sensing like a razor burn type issue or what, but, you know, the first pass on that thing was just absolutely beautiful. Now, just so you know, and for those listeners that uh, that like to give me a hard time because I don't know how to flip a razor, <laughs> yes, I did flip the razor to get probably closer to equal uh, time on each side of the double-edged blade. <laughs> ah, the sophomore shaver will be proud. <laughs> Anyhow... <laughs> Uh, it's just one of those things. Uh, you know, if you can't laugh, <laughs> if you can't laugh at the little things that you do, and if you can't laugh about people giving you a hard time about it, uh, maybe you just shouldn't go out in public. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> the, uh, the like I said, the, the first pass was just really, really smooth and wonderful. And the second pass was also good. I mean, it really was. It's not like the blade diminished instantaneously. It's not like, oh my gosh, the blade is so weak that, uh, that you know, it's ruined after one pass. No, it's just the first passes with that thing, it was, yeah, and, and maybe it was my expectation. Uh, you know, it's a treat blade for crying out loud, you know? They're made in Pakistan. Not that that's bad or anything, but... You know, they're a blade that costs 15 cents to a quarter, depending on, you know, where you're at. Yeah, my expectations were not too terribly high. And it surprised me. It truly did. Now, second pass, it was like, okay, well, yeah, it's, it's still a good blade, still doing a good job. And, uh, yeah. But it was just, it was just so much, and again, it might have been my expectations, just so much more on that first pass that it was, well, noticeable and noteworthy, and so I thought I'd mention it. Now, the uh, <clears throat> the other thing that helps, of course, is that the Katie's Bubbles uh, soaps, uh, well, uh, they're not any slouches in the whole mix. I mean, those are just, yeah, good soaps. In fact, I would be quite happy, to be quite honest, if I had nothing but Katie's Bubbles soaps in the den. That wouldn't bother me a whole lot. Uh, granted, you know, I would 
eventually like to have a little variety, but uh, I'd be set for a long, long time. It's, uh, yeah, they've got a good, good scent profiles, good, uh, you know, there's just, there's something in the Katie's Bubbles line just about for everybody. Anyhow, I saw some, this, this stuff called Honey Noir, and I said, hmm, I got to try that out. Now, to finish things off, to finish things off, I went the Noir route, uh, and finished up with some fine aftersage. <laughs> Can't talk this morning. Finished up with some fine aftershave, and specifically the uh, orange, l'orange noir, black orange. So, shaved with black honey, aftershave with black orange. So, it's, I guess I've got this black undertone this morning. <laughs> oh, well, it's a beautiful day, and if that's what it takes, well, there you go. Uh, it's just one of those things that's going to have to happen. And uh, don't mind it too terribly much at all. Well, you want to talk about a vendor stepping up. Okay, so I got an email not too long ago. A couple of I got an email a couple of days ago from uh, from Phoenix and Bo. Hi, Rick. My name is Kerry Burroughs, owner of Phoenix & Bow Shaving Soap Company. Recently, you placed an order for one of my artisan soaps from Maggard Razors. I hope you've been pleased with performance and scent. We are a husband and wife team that launched our range of products on February 29th, and we hand make our wares in our home studio that's situated in Hitchin, Hertfordshire, England. Now for the reason I'm writing. Soon after the first batch of soaps shipped to Maggard's Razor's customers, we had a few reports from people who had indicated their soaps weighed slightly less than the advertised 115 grams. The reason for this is as follows. Our soap is the evolution of a private formula that I used to make solely for myself and in tiny batch sizes. The curing period for a half-pound batch of hot processed soap is negligible, and I always found that I used my soap before it had a chance to lose any weight. As a consequence, I had not considered how the soap weight would diminish during its cure and evaporation of water. And unfortunately, a number of our soaps would have been shipped to customers that fell beneath our within 10 grams either side of 115 gram parameter. Both my wife and I were mortified on discovering this matter and wanted to deal with it face on, communicate with our excellent customers and articulate how the issue came about. A summary of our growth since launch a summary of our growth since launching Phoenix and Bow 14 weeks ago is as follows. We have a tremendous soap that our customers love. We have adopted and dealt with two oversights and have refined our product and methods even further. We are truly grateful for our customers' feedback and support. We now cure for a minimum of 2 weeks and add an additional 10 grams of soap to allow for the weight loss. After consulting with the excellent Brad Maggard, we decided to team up and take a proactive ap approach to resolving this issue. Re we realize that there is a chance that you were not affected, but we've decided to do something for everyone who bought a Phoenix and Bow soap regardless. Within 24 hours, you will receive a Maggard Razor store credit in the amount of $8 for every tub of Phoenix and Bow that you purchased from their site. To finish, we have an exciting second half of 2016 namely the release of our sixth core range tallow shaving soap, Albion, a tea soap no less, and four seasonal soaps, Denali, Star Noir, Baskerville, and Borealis, all of which will be available at Maggard's Razors. A moment on the uh, former scent profile, uh, Assam, Bergamot, and Grapefruit make up the core of its fragrance and are rounded out by the inclusion of locally sourced lavender and patchouli. Our first seasonal soap, Denali, is a mentholated soap based around camphor, menthol, menthol, eucalyptus, and peppermint and offers a wonderful cooling and invigorating shave. The designs for all up-and-coming labels are exquisitely crafted by my wife, Sarah, who is a trained illustrator. Both are scheduled for release June 30th. We sincerely appreciate your business and hope that you will give Phoenix and Bo a second chance as we work through these issues. With kind regards, Carrie, owner and conjurer of sense, Phoenix and Bo. And I did. I got my eight dollar store credit for uh, for Phoenix and Bo uh, for all of that. 
And uh, yeah, I uh, good stuff there. I mean, really, it's uh, it was a good uh, good thing. I mean, I have rarely seen uh, folks step up like that. Anyhow, I wrote them back. I said, thanks for the great support. Also, thanks for the exceptional customer support that uh, for the wet shaving community as a whole. I will be buying more of your products. I will not, however, be using any discount code or discount. Your explanation is perfectly logical, and I thank you for it. I reviewed your soap on episode 138 of my podcast, and if you'd like to hear it, uh, go to episode 138, last episode. In a nutshell, I really liked it. <laughs> Although my uh, my wife, who can't smell well, ha- had an interesting observation. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not going to be using any kind of a discount. Um, there's no reason that a vendor for something that, uh, to me, a perfectly logical explanation. Um, obviously, it was not done with malice. It was not done with the intent to, uh, to sweep it under the rug and... Uh, not let anybody know about it and hide it, uh, you know, when, when it was found out, you know, to step up and say, look, we'll give you an $8. I mean, you know, you're talking pretty much the whole margin of the soap there uh, as far as profits goes. So, uh, yeah, that is the way that the, uh, the artisans within our community react to a problem. Um, holy cow. Now, you want to talk about being blessed? We are blessed with artisans like Phoenix and Bo, like Carrie from Phoenix and Bo and his uh, wife Sarah, uh, Brad Maggard for uh, for helping distribute those wares, and uh, all the other vendors that uh, also step up in ways that are known and unknown uh, every day of the week to make this wet shaving community what it is. Holy cow. Huh. Hard to top that one. Good job. Let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, well, it's a pretty, pretty Friday morning. It's a little warm outside already, 74 degrees. Uh, Yeah, nice day. Sunshine, blue skies, good stuff. Anyhow, the the shave of the day today, uh, kind of a repeat of yesterday, although... As a uh, as a famous radio host uh, once coined the phrase from the groove yard of forgotten favorites, <laughs> um, since I'm not using my 1305 brush because I haven't reglued the knot back on yet, I whipped out the 830. Now, just for those of you that uh, have listened for a long time, the 830 was my first Samog brush. And uh, I have kind of not been using it because I like the handle on the 1305 better. Well, seeing as how the uh, 1305 is currently out of action, uh, we went ahead and soaked up the uh, 830 and uh, went to town with it, with the uh, Katie's Bubbles Honey Noir, and uh, life was good. Yeah, great lather. Holy cow. Thick, rich. Man, had that stuff looking like yogurt. It was, you know, it was one of those phenomenal lathers. It just really, really good. Still using the uh, the Gillette Red Tip with the Treat Silver. Um, Okay, so on the first pass today, did the did the silver blade strike me as anything well special? No. It was just yesterday in the first pass when it was like, holy cow. I don't know if it was a, a coating on it that did something special or just what it was. But yesterday, first pass, that was the day. Today, it was just, eh, it's okay. Got one nick. Um, that was probably more me than it was the blade. So uh, I can't really hold that against it. Uh, but other than that, I mean, I got a, a really nice shave out of it. Uh, second, second shave on that blade. So we'll see how it goes. If I start getting nicks and everything, well, that's going to kind of, yeah. At this point, I'm saying the nick was me, but, uh, we'll see. If I get more tomorrow, well, maybe it wasn't me. (laughs) 
anyhow, it's uh, just one of those things that uh, comes with experimenting with different blades. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll keep going. We'll keep playing around with it and uh, see what it comes up with. Now, didn't use any aftershave today, and I have been. Well, what's the word? I have been blessed, actually, with just whiffs of patchouli every now and then. Very, very pleasant. Very pleasant. I uh, really, really enjoy that. It's, uh, yeah, Katie's Bubbles does a good job with their fragrances. I, I've always, uh, always enjoyed that. Anyhow, that is the uh, that is the shave of the day. Hopefully your day's going well, too, and Hopefully you started off with a good shave as well. So it's the weekend again, and again because it is the weekend and because my neighbor uh, in the last couple of weeks cut down a bunch of trees and gave me a bunch of wood, and I didn't get it all done last weekend, I finished up, uh, piled up some more wood, cut it up and uh, into bite-sized chunks and... Uh, uh, put it up in a uh, in a firewood rack. Now the firewood rack that I've used. Now I've seen people uh, have built firewood racks and uh, you know made them out of wood and everything. Have roofs on them and all. I'm a little bit more primitive than that. To me, a uh, fire rack is uh, nothing more than some cinder blocks, some uh, some black iron pipe, and a tarp. Uh, yeah, it seems to work. Doesn't cost a whole lot, and uh, you can use the iron pipe when you're done for well other things. Um, keeps it up off the ground a good ways, and typically I don't have to worry about any kind of insects or anything because they won't uh, get into the the wood foundation of any firewood uh, house, if you will. Uh, if it's just up on cinder blocks and pipes, they have a tendency to kind of leave it alone. So uh, that's what I do, and I'll throw a picture up on the blog. But uh, threw some uh, some logs up into this thing to uh, to get them up off the ground because uh, if you leave them on the ground, they will rot, and they will rot quickly in my environment. And uh, well, we don't want that. We want them to dry out nicely so that we can use them for firewood. Now, when uh, when I talked to the guy originally, I said, yeah, you know, my scouts uh, use firewood, and they do. And, you know, we do from time to time. We do use firewood. But, uh, well, it's also a, a good energy source if you have a uh, if you have a fireplace, which I do. Um, so I've got that kind of going for me, too, you know, following the uh, scout motto of be prepared. <laughs> uh, and the cost was right. In other words, it was free. It's like, here, you want some of this stuff? Yeah. So uh, poplar and maple and oak and, yeah. In fact, I was able to even uh, chunk out a few pieces of pine that he had slipped in there and said, nah, well, we don't really want the pine. Uh, we'll throw that down here and just kind of burn that up in a bonfire but later. So uh, all is good. Yeah. You know, every now and then things happen for a reason, and I don't know, maybe this is one of them, but uh, it's nice to have a couple of racks of firewood just sitting out, you know, kind of behind the basketball goal. Also has the uh, the added effect that if someone misses the basketball goal, they hit the firewood instead of going in a neighborhood's, in a neighbor's yard, so there's a, a win there as well. You know, when you can function stack things, it's really great. <laughs> Uh, so all good stuff, and uh, more importantly, I was really once again very, very impressed that my chainsaw fired right up, uh, which didn't really surprise me. Um, tried my hand, <clears throat> excuse me, tried my hand at sharpening my chainsaw blade, and actually did a fairly reasonable job at it, which, believe it or not, kind of surprised me just a touch. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that to look forward to, although I do need a, 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 uh, a gauge for the, uh, for the limiters. There, there's little teeth in front of the blades that limit how much the, the blade can actually bite. And, uh, I need a gauge for those so that I can, uh, as I, as I sharpen the chainsaw chain, I can, uh, slowly take those down so that I have a, uh, a regular and, you know, continuous bite on the wood. But my chainsaw does still cut. My chains still cut well. I I can obviously sharpen them. So, uh, yeah, 
I'm thinking I'm in reasonable good shape for uh, for whatever comes that, well, needs to be cut up. <laughs> so uh, it's it's enjoyable. It's fun. I, uh, I like being able to just say, hey, grab the chainsaw, fire it up, and uh, let's go to town on something. That's a good feeling. And, uh, yeah. All righty. Let's talk about Saturday's shave of the day. Okay, so Saturday, beautiful day. Nice uh, nice day to just kind of kick back and not be too, well, hard-pressed to do anything quickly. Plenty of time. So, with that in mind, soaked up the 830 Samog brush, lathered up the Honey Noir from Katie's Bubbles, throw in a couple of teaspoons of water, and uh, proceed to create just an absolutely beautiful lather. Took an old gold dollar razor that I had. Eh, probably not the best razor in my uh, as far as edge. Not as far as ability to get an edge, but just as far as the edge. It's probably not the best, but I hadn't used it in a while. And, well, quite honestly, I'd forgotten. <laughs> So I uh, I went ahead and uh, stropped it a, a good uh, 50 or so times uh, pre-shave. Proceeded to shave with it. And a great shave. I mean, really, a really good shave. The weight of the blade is just really, really nice. And uh, the width of it is uh, not too bad. Um, great shave. The only problem, razor burn. I got razor burn from it. So I'm I need to uh, if if uh, any of you uh, hone meisters out there and I may throw this up on Facebook or Twitter or something. Um uh, you know what's the secret to eliminating razor burn in a straight razor? Uh Other than that, wonderful shave. Uh close shave, not a problem. No issues at all. No nicks, no cuts, nothing like that. Just razor burn. Hmm. Okay. Well, at the end of the shave, I threw on some uh, some uh, Pinot Clubman, and uh, aside from the initial sting, everything just kind of smoothed right out, and uh, not a problem. But uh, I will have to investigate just a touch, try to find out what is it about a razor's edge, the honing of a razor, if you will, that attributes to, to razor burn, because uh, it's the only razor that I have, that I know of, straight razor anyhow, that uh, has done that to me, at least to that extent. The rest of them, you know, they're nice smooth shavers, don't have a problem with them. But that one, well... Well, we made it through the weekend. We are at Monday morning. Another beautiful day out here, and uh, it all started off with an excellent shave of the day. Okay, so today's shave of the day, I am still using the Katie's Bubbles Honey Noir, uh, fantastic smelling soap, and uh, changed up a little bit. Instead of using a bore brush, I wanted to see how it would do with a synthetic. So went ahead and grabbed my fine synthetic brush. It's got a 20, uh, 20 millimeter knot, and... Uh, Got it just a little bit wet, shoved it in the soap, and proceeded to load up, dumped it over into the salsa bowl, and produced a lather that was yogurt thick and plenty of it. In fact, the picture from today was after a three-pass shave, and there's probably enough there to do at least, well, two passes, three if you wanted to uh, skimp just a little bit. But, uh Yeah. Good stuff. All right, so we are after the the weekend. Yesterday, you know, Saturday uh, when I went and shaved with a straight razor and got myself just a little bit of razor burn. Um, yesterday, I went and tried it with just a couple of passes with the straight razor, and then finished up with the uh, Gillette Red Tip with the treat blade in it. And then today, I just went all treat blade. Um, I did not suffer the same amount of razor burn yesterday as I did on Saturday, and I didn't suffer hardly any today, so I'm thinking it was me. (laughs) 
I'm thinking it was me using inappropriate pressure or whatever with my straight razor. Yeah, it happens, you know. Hey, if you don't do it all the time, you know, you, you get out of practice. But anyhow, <laughs> the good news is, is that everybody survived. Uh, no children were injured, nor were any animals. Uh, at least not in this episode. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, it was all good. And uh, so today, um, like I said, use the uh, use the Gillette Red Tip with the uh, Treat Silver. It's probably, uh, call it three full shaves. Yeah, call it three full shaves. The rest is just touch-up kind of stuff. So three full shaves on this blade so far. Not too shabby. It's starting to get a little bit weak, though. It's... Uh, it's leaving stuff down in the neck and uh, below the jawline area that it wasn't leaving before. So I'm thinking three shaves is probably all it can do. I'll go ahead and stretch it out just to see. But I'm thinking, you know, if I want to get really, really close, I'm going to have to do, you know, touch up on touch up on touch up kind of thing and uh, keep going over stuff until it finally uh, gives up. Uh, which was not the case with the first couple of shaves. So, uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that's what's going on today. Finished up, uh, with a little bit of balm, um, some orange balm from Locatane. I don't even know if you can get the stuff anymore, but, uh, got it as a gift pack, uh, about two years ago, I, I want to say. And, uh, used it every now and then. And I thought, you know, with the, with the honey noir, you know, the the patchouli and the and the honey and the and everything else that well, a little bit of cedar wouldn't be or a little bit of orange rather. Uh did I say cedar? Anyhow, a little bit of orange. Uh it's it's orange balm. Excuse me. Anyhow, a little bit of orange balm would uh fit right in and uh yeah, seems to do a good job. And uh provides a little bit of comfort for uh for the face. And, uh, cause I've been out in the sun last couple of days. And so, yeah, life is good. So here would be a good idea for a segment. Now, we have talked about, uh, certain things, you know, within a business environment disappearing. For example, subcontracting vehicle maintenance, subcontracting forklift maintenance, some co subcontracting facilities maintenance, because, well, it's not core business. The problem, of course, then, is that you don't control your own destiny, and you're dependent on the education and ability of others, which sometimes is not up to the same standards. You know, one of the things that we did, and in fact that I fought against for quite a while, and I've told this story to uh, to people at work multiple times, I had a gentleman who used to work for me who was a forklift mechanic. He had been a forklift mechanic for years. Essentially, his whole entire career was as a forklift mechanic. Before he came to our company, he actually worked for a company that built forklifts. And uh, he stayed with us for 30 years. Now, in our infinite wisdom, uh, we decided, and I understand from the financial perspective, I do understand that, um, we decided to subcontract forklift maintenance. Because, well, at least on paper anyhow, it looked like it was going to save us money and be less costly to allow someone else to take care of our forklifts instead of paying someone a salary that, uh, and benefits and everything else to, uh, to have them uh, maintain our forklifts. So we went ahead and, uh, you know, as a company, we, we did that. And the one place that we had not subcontracted forklift maintenances was in my facility because we had people that were vehicle mechanics for other reasons um, and could not be subcontracted. And so we also had the ability to maintain our own forklifts. 
So I, I brought this guy over, and uh, he was working on our forklifts, helping us out and doing an absolutely fabulous job. Okay. He went out on medical leave, and he was out for about six weeks on medical leave, and right after he went out on medical leave, there was a, a forklift that had a problem. It was not functioning correctly. Now, because he was out on medical leave, our fallback position was to have the guys that you know, we had subcontracted with for our other facilities come in and work on our forklifts. And so they were doing maintenance and PMs and things like that on our forklifts. And so we ha essentially handed them this one forklift that was having an issue and saying, okay, here it is, fix it. Um, okay, so the first week uh, they went through the forklift and couldn't find what the problem is, was, couldn't find what the issue was. All right. The second week, we had a new uh, forklift technician go through, and he could not find the problem and or issue either. The third week, we had the technician, which is a higher level maintenance guy from the uh, from the shop uh, back at the uh, at the main building, come and take a look at it, and he couldn't figure out what the problem was either. This went on back and forth to the point where this company basically came up to us and told us, you need a new forklift. This thing's trash. This thing's, you know, there's there's no saving it. There's no help for it. There's no nothing. It's, it's dead. It's gone. You might as well just bury it and call it a day. Hmm. Okay, well, it had been running. And, uh, all right. So, six weeks later. The guy that routinely works on our forklift, the, the company employee that we have that works on our forklifts, comes back. And he comes back, and after he gets situated, which takes him a day, uh, he goes into the shop, and he looks at this forklift, and he walks up to it. And within a half hour, he comes to my office, and he says, Okay, I know what's wrong with the forklift, but we don't have the part, and I can't find it anywhere. But uh, I think I've got it at home. I'll let you know. Okay. The next day I go back out in the shop and the forklift's running. And he hands me a diode. He hands me a diode that costs about 30 cents. And he says, yes, this is the problem. We didn't have one in stock, but I had one of my parts been at the house, so I brought one in. Don't worry about it. You know, it's a 30 cent diode. I don't care. All right, so we have a guy who's been working on forklifts all his life, is able to troubleshoot a problem that he has, uh, you know, just walked into in a matter of a half a day that a subcontracted employee and the technician up at the shop took six weeks and basically threw up their hands and gave up on. Now, the moral of this story is not to say one is smarter than the other. The one was able to do it in a half a day because of experience, because of the desire to learn and the experience on the job within a given task. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is that once you subcontract you lose control of your own destiny. You lose control of the ability to train up. It becomes very, very difficult. So, a scenario. We have four forklift mechanics at a site. We subcontract and those four forklift mechanics go away. And now all of a sudden, if we want to go back to doing our own forklift maintenance, First off, we've lost all that experience because they've gone on to other jobs, they've left the company, they've done whatever. So we have to start from scratch, and we have to train them. And we have to figure out how to train them. And we have to give them the tools to bring them up to the level of the people that we let go. You know, so it's very similar to what we face on a daily basis as new wet shavers. We're not used to handling double-edged razors. We're not used to handling single-edged razors. We have to retrain ourselves as a community because 
Lord knows with the education and training that we have, we cannot show our children how to use single-edge and double-edge razors because we don't know ourselves. And if you want to go into the realm of straight razors, it becomes a whole different animal. So now you're talking about a training scenario that is really, really uh, rather cumbersome, to be quite honest, compared to being taught by your father and growing up with it. So it's very similar. Now the problem is, is that every time we essentially do something like subcontract something or allow something to go somewhere else, we face this same issue. So whether that be, you know, in the southeast, for example, when we let textile jobs go to other countries, when we let textile factories go to other com uh, other countries, was it good for the shareholders? Yes, because the cost of the labor was a lot less. However, over time, what ends up happening is you're in a situation now where if we brought back textile to the southeast, um, it wouldn't be families and generations of experience that had grown up with it anymore. Because we've lost that. And gaining it back would be very hard and very difficult. So we did it to ourselves for a short-term gain. But long-term, we pay the price. Very similarly, you know, again, in wet shaving, we, we did it to ourselves by giving up the straight razors and the single edge and the double edge to go with the much more <clears throat> convenient and, uh, and easier-to-use cartridge razors, for example. And now, quite honestly, we're paying a price having to relearn what it is that we lost. So the question that I always ask myself, especially when it comes to, you know, the fairly heavy and, and large national topics of, you know, this business going to another country or this this thing being subcontracted or whatever, I always ask myself, how painful is it going to be to to gain, to regain that information and knowledge base? You know, if if something like a, an automobile manufacturer goes to another country, okay, as long as we have some basis for that job skill here in the United States, okay, maybe. But when you start looking at, okay, now we're going to take, for example, foundries. If we get into a situation where all of our foundries go away and, and go somewhere else. We've just lost that. And trying to reincorporate the education and the knowledge base of how a foundry works and what really happens and how things really operate, you don't just gain that easily in a couple of years. Once you let it walk out the door, it's very difficult to get it to come back. So it's something to keep in mind, you know. Uh, it's, again very similar to what we've done with shaving. You know, when you first picked up a brush and a puck of soap, how long did it take you to get to the point where you could really generate a really, really nice lather? Because you'd given that up for the sake of doing a can. Something to think about. Something to think about. Sometimes short-term gains are not all they're cracked up to be. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher.